Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to this meeting of the Build Heritage Subcommittee. Uh, we have no regrets. Any declarations of interest? None? Great. Confirmation of minutes from our meeting of March 8th, 2018. Um, are those okay? Great. So we have two substantive items today, um, both of which, um, for which we have speakers registered, so uh, we won't go through a consent agenda. Our first item is an application to alter 132 Lisger Road, a property located in Rockland Park Heritage Conservation District. Um, so we'll ask staff to provide um, uh, a brief presentation, uh, and then we'll go to our public delegations. Good morning. This is an application for alteration at 132 Lisger Road in Rockcliffe Park. The property is located across the street from Rideau Hall and next to the official residence of the Norwegian ambassador. The lot is quite large with an expansive garden <coughs> on the front, at the front of the house. The property is a grade one within the Heritage Conservation District. It includes a noteworthy front lawn, a two-story house with a side gable roof and horizontal cladding. The house is simple in design and has a center hall plan with the entrance centered between bay windows and flanked by side lights and classical moldings. Here are some of the views of the streetscape, looking both north and south along Lisco Road. The neighboring Norwegian ambassador's residence can be seen in the top image, while the gates of Rideau Hall <coughs> can be seen in the lower one. The proposal includes two additions, one to the north of the property over an existing screen porch, as well as a two-story addition to the south. These are colored gray, oh, can't really see it in the image, colored gray in the slide. The landscaping will remain untouched, as will the existing driveway. The northern addition will be clad in a similar cementitious horizontal uh, cladding to match the existing house and will be topped in a side gable roof with cedar shingles. The addition will slightly overhang the lower floor, which echoes the second floor cantilever of the existing house. The new addition to the south is a two-car garage with living space above. The addition will have a flat roof and will be clad in the same cementitious horizontal cladding. This addition will be set back considerably from the street and the front of the house and will be topped in a simple cornice. The side yard setback of the garage requires a variance from 3.5 meters as required by the zoning bylaw to 1.5 meters. A key attribute, a heritage attribute of the Rockwell Park Heritage Conservation District plan is general spacing and setbacks of the buildings. And the plan's guidelines speak in general to preserving landscape setbacks. In this instance, heritage staff can support the variance sought as it will not have an adverse impact on the totality of the landscape character of the lot, which is defined by its large front yard landscape and the streetscape. This is the rear facade. The addition to the north will feature a project, projecting gabled bay echoing the gable on the existing house. The south addition will have a flat roof and cornice. These are the two side elevations showing both the north or top image and the south the bottom image of the additions. Here are some perspective renderings showing the new additions. The additions are lower than the existing building. The south addition is well set back from the front facade in order to allow the existing building to retain its primacy on the lot. It's clad in materials that reflect the character of the original house and are typical of the area. Although similar in expression, the additions are distinguishable from the original house as they are set back from the facade and lower than the roof, providing a visual break between old and new. The setback on the southern side of the property will be reduced and will, further, and will provide a landscape buffer that is less than typically desired by some of the guidelines that speak to landscaping for new buildings and additions. In particular, not all components of guideline 7.3, so 7.4.3, uh, number one and seven, which speak to setbacks, topography, and existing landscape features are being preserved, uh, being preserved will not fully be achieved on the southern side of the property. However, staff have determined that this impact is mitigated by the character defining large front yard, which will remain in its entirety, as well as the hedges, flower beds, pathways, landscaping features that establish the character of the lot. While additions will increase lot coverage, the lot coverage will remain low. The prevalence of soft landscaping will remain and the established character of the streetscape will be respected. The existing grades of the property are to, are to be maintained and no mature trees are to be removed. 
For these reasons, staff recommends approving the application to alter the building, approve the landscape plan, delegate authority for minor changes, and to issue a heritage permit with a two-year expiry date. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, we'll go right to our speakers list, uh, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions and comments to staff thereafter. Um, so we have, uh, at this stage, four speakers registered. Uh, the first is uh, Lin Linda DeCare. Good morning, and welcome to the subcommittee. You have five minutes to speak, and when you're ready, you can just press the button on the microphone. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Linda DeCare, and I'm chair of the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Committee, and I have about uh, 35 years in experience in heritage conservation. Um, we've had uh, the opportunity to discuss this application in depth with city staff, and while most of the proposed changes are readily supportable, um, in one very important res respect, this application does not meet the provisions, as mentioned, um, one of the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Plan, two, the Rockcliffe Park Secondary Plan, and three, a recent decision of the Committee of Adjustment. This is of real uh, concern to us, and I would like to carefully address this. And I wish to emphasize that we support the outcome. Um, why is this of concern to us? The proposed addition of a two-car garage to the south of the house will result in a setback from the side yard property line of just under five feet, 1.5 meters. The zoning bylaw requires more than twice this distance, 11.5 feet. Um, so the proposed setback is a fraction of what is required. Setbacks do matter, and this was mentioned. The whole park-like character of Rockcliffe Park and the careful siting of houses within it are the core reasons that Rockcliffe Park was designated a heritage conservation district over 20 years ago. So this character can only be maintained if the generous spacing between buildings is maintained. So let's look at what the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Plan says. It begins with a statement of cultural value. That statement is the foundation upon which the rest of the plan is built. The statement identifies the generosity of space around the houses as being essential to the whole concept of Rockcliffe Park from its origins. Then the heritage plan sets out the heritage attributes of Rockcliffe Park that are to be preserved. Among the heritage attributes are two that are relevant here. First, the unobtrusive siting of the houses on streets and the generous spacing relative to the neighborhood buildings. And second, the generous spacing and setbacks of the buildings. So the plan could not be clearer about the importance of generous spacing and setbacks. Let's look second at the Rockcliffe the secondary plan, which was also mentioned. As you know, it's part of the official plan. The secondary plan starts with a statement of community vision that guides everything that follows. Right up there in the statement are the following. It is the desire of the community as expressed in this plan to protect the present environment, including the spatial relationships between buildings. Third and finally, I want to draw your attention to a decision by the Committee of Adjustment about a year ago. The Committee of Adjustment was considering an application that amongst other things proposed a garage that was only four feet from the property line. The Committee of Adjustment rejected this. It said that this is not in conformity with the generous spacing between buildings that is part and parcel of the heritage character of Rockcliffe Park. That uh, was a significant statement. I think the conclusion to be drawn from all of this could not be clearer. The proposal to add a garage to the Grade 1 house at 132 Lisker that brings it within about five feet of the property line does not conform with the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Plan and its secondary plan as, and is at odds with a reason, the recent decision of the Committee of Adjustment. So exceptionally, we do support, nonetheless, this application. And we do so for one reason, solely because the house at 132 Lisker is set back from the road at some 80 feet. This is truly exceptional. It will not create, in our opinion, a precedent if you identify this reason as part of your decision. This expensive and beautiful front yard setback provides a long vista to the house that you have seen in photographs, significantly mitigating the impact of the much reduced side yard. 
We also note that the neighbor affected by this much reduced side yard does not object to this. This is the first time that our Heritage Committee has ever supported a, such a development that does not accord with the protections that the city has put in place to preserve the heritage character of Rockcliffe Park. So we reject any attempt to claim that the seriously inadequate setback in question is in accord with the plan, the secondary plan, or the decision of the Committee of Adjustment, and we don't think that that is what you've heard today. So we have demonstrated that, that it is a, um, an exception that is worthy of support. So uh, without saying anything further, I would like to acknowledge the extensive cooperation and collaboration that we've had with city staff on this file, and I thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention. Um, any questions uh, for Mr. Carrick? No? Thank you very much for coming. So the next speaker on our list is uh, Susan DeCino, and uh, she will be followed by David Jeans from Heritage Online. Good morning, and welcome to the subcommittee. Okay, now it is. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm here, I'm no longer on the Rockcliffe Park Heritage Committee, uh, but I am a member of the, on the board of the Rockcliffe Park Residents Association, as I have been for some time. Um, I wanted to, um, uh, of course, uh, re endorse everything that Linda DeCare has just put in front of you. We do support this application as an exception. And what we would like to ask um, the Built Heritage Subcommittee is in, in recommending um, to uh, Council that this application um, uh, be approved, that in your decision uh, you acknowledge for the record that the side yard setback does not conform with provisions of our heritage plan and the Rockcliffe Park secondary plan, but is supportable for exceptional reasons. We think this is important. Um, we are now working um, on two tracks after what uh, we found the, um, uh, the, the decision on 551 Fairview. Um, we have been working both with Heritage, uh, with the city staff to see if we cannot come to uh, uh, some approach, some shared understanding of what our heritage plan says and means. And we have had meetings with six other um, heritage <coughs> conservation districts in Ottawa um, to share um, our view, uh, to share views and concerns about um, uh, how heritage plans are being interpreted and um, put in place um, by city council. So, um, in order to make it clear that this does not set a precedent, um, we would like, as I say, it to be acknowledged. Um, that it is not that this side yard setback most clearly does not conform with our heritage plan or the Rockcliffe Park secondary plan. And if you could give us that comfort, then I think we could um, uh, look forward to some um, fruitful, uh, perhaps, meeting of minds uh, with the city staff on, um, on a shared interpretation of our heritage plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for those comments. Uh, so next on the list is uh, David Jeans, and he will be followed by uh, Wayne Frawley. Thank you, Chair. Heritage Ottawa supports the staff recommendation and also strongly supports the remarks which have been made uh, by Linda DeCare and Susan DeKino, representing the view of the Rockwood Park Community Association. Uh, we do uh, feel strongly that uh, this should be considered as a case on its own special merits and that it not be used as a precedent. Uh, uh, there is a risk that that could be used in uh, tribunal hearings going forward uh, unless you take some action as, as has been proposed in your recommendation to Council. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions for Mr. Jeans? Uh, maybe I will ask one. Um, so uh, I'm curious a little bit about the point about precedent. Uh, one of the things that we're always told is that uh, every application is evaluated on its own merits. Yes. That consideration of um, uh, a particular application is made on the specific conditions uh, of that site. 
I've read the staff report, and there is specific mention of many of the important points that were made by representatives of the Rockland mm -hmm. Park Residents Association. Um, and, of course, the staff report becomes part of the public record. Um, so I'm just curious um, what the fear would be. The fear would be that in a future application, the staff would say, notwithstanding the fact that there were different circumstances here, we're going to accept uh, less generous spacing between two buildings. I, 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 no, I, I, our, our concern is not so much what city staff might do with future applications. It's just that having allowed a smaller side yard setback here, uh, other proponents in future uh, might uh, use the evidence from uh, the approval of, of this application as a uh, reason that uh, uh, such reduced setbacks might be allowed in other cases in future. But uh, we're, we're not, uh, we certainly haven't gone into the legal aspects here. We're mainly responding to the concern which you've already heard uh, about this as being a, a, an exceptional and, and one time, um, uh, as, as you say, uh, that, that is identified in the staff report, but that that's an important aspect of approving this proposal. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, next on the speaker's list is uh, Wayne Frolic. Good morning and welcome to the subcommittee. You have uh, five minutes to speak. Good morning. Uh, I'm Wayne Frolic. I was working with the owners uh, on this project, so I'm just here to answer any questions should any arise. Any questions, uh, Member Smalley? Are you the architect or designer? designer. Okay, yes. uh, I did have a question. I, I, I support the, the 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 look of the house and what's been done. The only question I had about it was the addition, as you're facing the house on the left-hand side, which is over top of the current uh, sunroom. It struck me that the sunroom is very light and transparent and uh, the addition over top of it seems heavy and it looks visually to me like one is crushing the other and I just wondered if any thought had been given to possibly beefing up the support structure that appears to hold that second floor up just because it does seem at least to me a little heavy there. Yeah uh, we actually looked at that when we first designed the uh, master on the top and found some images and and also you can see by the renderings there uh, it does we feel it does work we're looking at uh, there is some landscaping that does exist that is not shown on that rendering so we're looking at doing a couple things maybe uh, reinforcing the landscaping around the base of that addition and also uh, you know maybe looking at color or if we do have to beef up the, the the columns then we would look at doing something like that and we'll work with heritage when to fine-tune that any other questions uh, seeing none thank you very much uh, for thank coming you. out this morning okay um, there are no other speakers on the list uh, questions or comments for staff member small <clears throat> I um, with respect to the <coughs> Excuse me. With respect to the uh, issue of precedent setting, I just wondered if um, we often see situations where somebody comes forward and says, <clears throat> uh, this house is not, we can't keep it anymore, it's got mold in the basement or there's a crack in the wall somewhere, uh, we need to tear it down. And in the case of this particular house, <clears throat> if they were to come forward and say, I'm going to tear the old part of the house down, but keep the additions, including the addition which encroaches into the side yard, would they <clears throat> be then able to build the new house further forward because they now have permission to build this into the side yard, build it further forward into the front yard, the very thing that the reason we're giving this thing, would, would they then be able to do that um, because the ho a new house could be built further forward? Thank you. <clears throat> Um, that's a highly hypothetical question, um, Member Smallwood, but I'd be happy to answer it. Um, 
one of the character defining elements that was identified in this report is the expansive front yard so if somebody if this house um, uh, if somebody wanted to build forward on the lot um, I think that there is um, you know, through visual analysis and individual analysis of any report as received at the time the I'm, I'm speculating but um, I think that the answer would be no that, um, that there are other guidelines regarding the placement of new houses that they should be on the site of the existing house or uh, or back not forward so I think that one could rest assured if there was a catastrophe in the middle part of this house collapsed and the two ends remained there would be no um, there would be, there would be very strong um, there are very strong guidelines to prevent a new house from creeping closer to Lisker and of course as counts as chair Nussbaum pointed out every application is judged at the time of its receipt Um, okay, any other questions? Maybe I'll, I'll ask legal um, a question because I'm, uh, I'm just deliberating over this issue of whether or not an acknowledgement, if the committee chose to believe and acknowledge that the application violated the Rockville Park Heritage Conservation District Plan, um, could you just perhaps um, uh, just comment on that, on that hypothetical? Chair, the, the question that I, I believe you're asking is whether or not you're going to amend the recommendations to include such an acknowledgement or if you would simply like to make a statement. Are, are you asking to, to amend the report? Well, I guess I'm asking if, if, if you've seen that, what would be the legality? I mean, I had understood that it was our role, uh, although this plan is under appeal, it is our job to uphold the plan. Uh, certainly as a statement of policy by Council until such time as the appeal process is finished. Uh, but I guess I'm curious as to whether uh, there is any precedent for this uh, uh, of what is being asked to uh, essentially accept the staff recommendation but amend it to say that we believe that this is a violation of the Rockville Park Heritage Conservation District Plan. I'm curious if you in your experience uh, have seen this kind of approach before. Um. Chair, I, I have not, and I, I would be reluctant to approve and disprove the staff recommendation in the, in the same context. I, I don't know if that answers your question, Chair. Uh, however, um, if you are accepting the staff recommendation as your recommendation to pass along to Planning Committee and Council under the heritage elements, to then say that despite this acceptance, this is, we are, this is, not appropriate, I, I would think that those statements are contradictory and could cause problems in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, I think um, in considering this item that I had underlined in, in my version of the staff report, uh, the following paragraph, which I'm just going to read out. Uh, the setback on the southern side of the property will be reduced and will provide a landscape buffer that is less than typically desired by the guidelines. Staff have determined that this impact is mitigated by the character defining large front lawn which will remain in its entirety as well as the hedges, flower beds and pathways, landscaping features that establish the character of the lot. While the additions will increase lot coverage, the lot coverage will remain low, etc., etc. Um, so I guess my inclination is to see that paragraph as being very critical in establishing that staff are acknowledging that in normal cases they would have or they would like to see and will uh, continue to want to see uh, m more buffer uh, as the guidelines establish. So that gives me some comfort in the fact that there is an acknowledgement that there is less than, as they say, is typically uh, desired. So m my hope, and given that this staff report will remain on, on the public record, that this uh, will satisfy any attempt by a future applicant to use this as a precedent because the staff have considered this in a specific case. So in light of the response from legal and the inclusion of this language in the staff report, um, I'm comfortable with the staff report, um, but uh, am open to um, uh, other comments uh, on it before we, we move to carry it. There's a comfort level there? Great, so is the recommendation carried? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much and thank you um, to those members of the public that came out this morning.
So uh, let's move to uh, the next item, which is uh, relates to an application to permit the demolition of the Ugandan High Commission at 231 Coburg Street. Um, and as members will recall, this came before us uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, we decided at that stage um, to uh, to refer this back back to staff. Um, I'll get the exact language in a moment. Thank you. Um, so, therefore, be it resolved is what we said uh, back in February that the application to demolish the building at 231 Coburg Street be referred to staff for further review, and that the City of Ottawa be directed to engage a structural engineer with heritage experience to provide an independent engineering report which speaks to the structure of the existing building, and based on the additional information in the independent review, that the applicant be encouraged to prepare a revised application that retains or incorporates a significant portion of the existing building, or a new design that better reflects the recommendations contained in the applicant's cultural heritage impact statement. So that's the context for this piece. Um, we'll start by having uh, staff uh, report back uh, on uh, progress made, and then we'll go to public delegations. Councillor Fleur? Is it, is it possible to just um, set, set the context to this? As you know, there was a, a motion that you spoke to, and I, I just have some concerns as to the work that staff undertook. So I wonder if I could just make a statement prior to uh, staff presentation and delegation if, if committee uh, would accept. Well, we can do this one of two ways. We can hear from staff and then I can go to you first uh, and then we'll hear from public delegations. Does that, what, does that work? Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, over to staff first, please. Uh, good morning, committee. Um, uh, as uh, Chair Nussbaum outlined, this is back to, um, to you after it was initially considered on February the 8th. Uh, and it is an application to demolish and replace the Ugandan High Commission at 231 Coburg Street, a property located in the Wilbrod Laurier Heritage Conservation District. The subject property is located at the corner of uh, Wilbrod and um, Laurier. It is the uh, edge of the Heritage Conservation District uh, and to its north is a 1950s bungalow uh, and, uh, and then th this area is the Heritage Conservation District and this is the side of a building that faces, um, that faces real broad. Again, this is the Heritage Conservation District. You can see that the subject property is located here at the corner of Coburg and Wilbrod and the boundary of the district runs through its backyard. The district is distinguished by a number of large embassies, mostly housed in 19th century um, houses. These include uh, Brazil, Australia, Brunei and France, but there are others there too. There is in addition a, um, uh, a an earlier house that was owned by Lester Pearson on Augusta and uh, other single f uh, houses that have been converted to uh, are converted dwellings and single family dwellings and some also uh, built later. So it is um, a mixed district. The Heritage Conservation District Plan describes the district as an excellent example of a late 19th century upper middle class neighbor residential neighborhood. The following slides show the house, oops, and we're going to have to skip around because this is in, okay, the following, um, uh, oh yes, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, so the Wilbur um, Laurier Heritage Conservation District, as I said, I just, um, a collection of houses, um, primarily residential, uh, it uh, is characterized by large covered open front porches and verandas, generous front lawns with shrubs and trees, and some low front yard fences. Um, there is consistent side yard setbacks, uh, and the, the historic streets and lot lotting pattern remain, and one of its other elements is the deciduous street trees and boulevards. 
again, the current conditions, excuse me. So this is the building. It was um, constructed in 1941, replacing a larger house. Uh, and the two buildings to its east were also built after the removal of this large 19th century house. The building, built as a flat roof two unit building, uh, it, with a shared front entrance. So it was um, it, it, uh, a semi-detached with a common entrance. Um, it does not, uh, the, it's very simply in design and execution with few external um, decorations and uh, the decoration that exists is expressed in the same brick as the building is constructed. So we have very subtle coining, um, a secondary cornice here and this octagonal window. Other than that, it is um, uh, you know, uh, devoid of other uh, decoration, unlike the richly embellished Queen Anne revival houses that are found elsewhere in the district. Um, there's no backyard. Um, from 1955 to 1958, Lester Pearson and his wife owned one of the units in the building. At the time, he was the Minister of External Affairs and had offices in the East Block. In 1957, he was uh, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work establishing the peacekeeping force in Egypt during the 1956 Suez Crisis prompted by Nasser's removal, uh, nationalization of the Suez Canal. Although Pearson lived at 231 Coburg when he received the, pri the prize, the building is not explicitly or meaningfully associated or identified with his work at the time, which took place at the UN and uh, within the offices of the Canadian uh, government. So here is the, again, that, that's the building and its associations again. And you can see the, at, at the, this is outside of the district and the district continues that way. The Ontario Heritage Act um, governs buildings that are designated under part five of the Ontario, um, and under part five, and it, uh, all applications for new construction in, and demolitions in heritage districts require approval of council after consultation with the Bill to Heritage Subcommittee, so that is why we are here today. The, demo, the, the application includes the demolition of the existing building and the construction of a three-story replacement building, and in addition, the proposal requires site plan approval and a rezoning. Staff recommendation is to approve the application to demolish 231 Coburg Street and approve the application for new construction in the district. Um, the demolition... The, the following slides show some, uh, they were shown to you in February, some of the effects of the cracking in, in the property. Um, the engineering study of 2013 attributed this cracking to the desiccation of the, so of the clay soils uh, in the area as a result of the hot, dry summers in the late 1990s and again in 2011 and 12. There was also localized desiccation as a result of adjacent trees, the largest of which has been removed. The settling and cracking of the High Commission um, prompted the inhabitants, the Ugandan uh, staff, um, to, to leave their offices there in 2014. Um, during their tenure, which uh, they had owned the building for 20 years prior to, the, um, to their departure, um, there had been attempts to crack the building. Um, uh, to repair the building, excuse me. And the, 20, the 2015 engineering report commissioned by the High Commission described the building as a wood frame structure supported with wood bearing stud walls and masonry blocks that themselves were supported by reinforced con concrete footings. The basement floor is a four inch concrete slab. According to that engineer, to repair the buildings, there was a system of piles that halved that would have to be um, inserted to support the building. At your meeting, so here's further evidence of the cracking, and at your meeting of February 8th, the bill t uh, there was a recommendation passed, which is included in your report and um, synopsized here. But the motion requested that the city engi engage an, an engineer with heritage expertise to review previous engineering studies and to examine the building to confirm the damage and its causes. So that is the, the part of the motion uh, associated with the engineering report. The engineer who wrote that report uh, is here today and is registered to speak. And also that report was circulated with this, uh, with your, um, uh, with your uh, package. So you've had an opportunity to have a, have a look at that. But the conclusion of that 
um, report. Um, uh, and one of the other things, that, so in addition to uh, looking at the building, the, um, the engineer was asked to look at the previous reports that had been undertaken, which was a number of geotechnical and, and, um, and uh, engineering reports. So the conclusion, and again, um, I will, uh, not being an engineer and having a little expertise uh, in engineering, um, I will uh, you know, let the engineer speak. But the conclusion, uh, this is the conclusion here of the Cook Report um, that, uh, and the report concluded that the observed and previously reported settlement issues and the damage it has caused to the building structure is significant. While structurally feasible, the cost to undertake work to establish, to stabilize the building is similarly significant. The heritage value of the typo V asset must be weighed with the cost of rehabilitation, and this is well discussed in the cultural heritage impact statement. Based on this and significant effort to undertake stabilization, we support recommendations for demolition. So that is the findings of the report that was independently con um, undertaken uh, and paid for by the City of Ottawa at the request of the Built Heritage Subcommittee on February the 8th. And again, and these are the studies. This is also in your the staff report. These are the studies that were reviewed. So there has been extensive analysis of the building um, over over time. So those were the findings of uh, the the work. Uh, and again, the engineers here. Um, in addition, the Built Heritage Subcommittee um, instructed staff to study the possible inclusion. We'll go back to. Sorry the possible inclusion of elements of the building uh, into the new design or to further refine the design to reflect the recommendations of the cultural heritage impact statement. Uh, in analyzing the building, um, staff determined that uh, the retention of elements was uh, not the best approach because um, of it could pose a risk of creating a pastiche, um, which was neither uh, new or old, so there'd be uh, difficulty determining uh, whether it was an old building or a new building, which is not consistent with the standards and guidelines. Um, that, uh, again, frequently when there are requests to um, retain elements, uh, the building has um, more clearly defined um, elements that could be repeated, such as a terracotta panel or a barge board, et cetera, or, or a, a uh, frontispiece or window surround. So again, as stated, this is a very simple building. It would be hard to find elements to uh, reincorporate. And finally, the idea of um, we also uh, looked at and thought about the idea of brick retention. Brick retention is a notoriously difficult thing to do. Um, the, uh, uh, many bricks are lost in deconstruction with the removal of, um, removal of mortar. Uh, so there, the risk is that there wouldn't be enough building, uh, bricks to rebuild a building. It's very difficult to mix built bricks of different types because of different levels of porosity. So that, um, uh, having done that analysis, that we determined that um, the, the um, the better route would be to uh, work with the architect on further changing the, the designs that more closely reflected some of the elements that were executed in brick on the original building, but in new construction. Sorry, just... So um, as uh, the presentation I made in February uh, pointed out, we have worked extensively with the, um, with the architect um, uh, and our colleagues in urban design and land use planning to, um, to uh, bring this building into closer conformity um, or into conformity with the Heritage Conservation District guidelines for infill construction. Um, initially, there was a, uh, a wheelchair ramp, uh, it, taller, this was not set back. So this ended up with this um, version of the, of the building that you saw in February. And again, the motion was to look at bringing it closer into conformity with the recommendations also of the Cultural Heritage Impact Statement. So this is the property, that it, the building that is in front of you today. Changes that um, were uh, undertaken to, uh, to reflect the recommendations of the Cultural Heritage Impact Statement include uh, separating 
these two uh, these two windows so that they read more clearly as um, as as uh, have a more domestic appearance. Um, and the um, the creation of and you'll be able to see it better in the elevations. But the creation of a of a cornice line and some to to mark the secondary cornice that you that is uh, in the existing building. The um, piercing of the brick here uh, to uh, create some just visual interest, so it didn't appear to be quite so institutional. And that brick um, again is uh, acts as a brise soleil, and the light comes through to the windows behind and on the Wilbrod um, uh, street edge where there is um, more of the 19th century character that faces into the Heritage Conservation District um, is the, the creation of a, of a parapet that reflects the roof lines of, of some of the buildings found within the Heritage Conservation District. And we can go into this in a bit more detail with the other plans. So there's the first two. This is the current, uh, the current um, uh, uh, proposal in front of you today. Again, we can see it in the elevation, but there is this secondary cornice line that is carried across all all levels, and then it does go down to imitate the coining of the original building. And here are befores and afters again. And then the elevations. Oh, and, and then I think. Uh, um, some people uh, were, perhaps weren't aware that this is a freestanding wall and there's a window there. So it is, um, uh, again, uh, and the, the octagonal window draws attention to the, uh, to the original octagonal window, which is the major decorative element on the front facade of the building, and that motif is, rep is uh, repeated here. Again, this uh, shows some of the, the elevation so more clearly, some of the elements that were introduced to echo uh, the, uh, to, to, uh, the recommendations of the Cultural Heritage Impact Statement. So this is a uh, change in the, in, the, in the brick and, um, and then this line to imitate the coins of the existing building or to evoke the coins of the existing building. And these are the further elevations. So it's, uh, every, it's repeated on every facade. So it's not just for the front facade. Again, uh, this, the, uh, this is a freestanding element um, in front of the third story, again, allowing the light to penetrate, but giving a more um, domestic appearance with a contemporary um, Interpretation. So the Wilfred, uh, the, Wil the Wilbrod Laurier guidelines say new buildings will contribute to and not detract from the heritage character of the district, and the new buildings should be of their own time and not attempt to replicate an historic style, but must be sympathetic to the character of the building. Um, so this building replaces the 1941 building with a new one that's similar in form and mass. It's of its own time, does not replicate an historic style, is, is sympathetic to the Heritage Conservation District, and has been made more sympathetic um, through the more recent interventions on the part of the architect. And again, its, uh, its design is inspired by the facade proportions, the penetration pattern, and the flat roof of the original. Further, uh, further guidelines uh, address cladding, and this is red brick. Uh, this new building is red brick to reflect the character of the HCD, and the third, the gray panels evoke the gable ends in the district. Um, again, the windows are aligned to reflect the, the, the traditional window patterns in the HCD, and have been further tweaked to um, more closely rec reflect that in this version of the building. Standards and guidelines conserve the character of an historic place. Um, uh, the, the new building will not have a, heritage imp a negative impact on the he defined heritage attributes of the HCD and the landscaping will be enhanced. Standard 11 talks about conserving the heritage value and character defining elements when creating new additions um, or any related new construction. And in this case, the use of brick, the regular window openings, the flat roof and simple landscape plan are compatible with the mixed uh, character of the HCD which, um, and its character defining elements. Uh, the Cultural Heritage Impact Statement again um, uh, determined that, uh, that the intervention was appropriate. Um, when the new drawings were released, um, uh, the 
heritage consultant who's also here today. It was, I, I, I contacted him and asked him uh, his opinion of, um, the, of the new interventions and he was supportive and felt that they, recommend, uh, that they reflected the three recommendations in the Built Heritage Subcommittee motion um, that, were, that, that the applicant was directed to look at. Consultation, um, uh, because uh, Bill Heritage Subcommittee, um, there was a tight timeline prescribed by the committee for their return. Um, I did not, re I recirculated um, all Councillor Fleury, Action Sandy Hill, and Heritage Ottawa um, as soon as I received re revised plans, but that was um, in the, uh, at the end of March, and uh, so didn't, I did not receive any comments on these prior to today, but now there are comments from both Action Sandy Hill and Heritage Ottawa, and Councillor Fleury is here to speak. So um, uh, uh, that, uh, that was expected because of the, again, uh, the direction to have this back in two months after the February um, meeting. So in conclusion, um, uh, staff believes that uh, supports the application as a mid 20th century replacement. Um, that is noted to have uh, a high, uh, the wide range of building types. This is an appropriate intervention um, that the building is not explicitly or meaningfully identified with the work of Lester Pearson during his tenure there. Uh, and again, the, the structural damage to the building as the result of unstable soil conditions have made it unsafe. Um, and for all these reasons, Heritage staff supports the application. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So before we go to our list of speakers, Councillor Fleury has asked to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my, my biggest concern, and I did meet with staff prior to, uh, to today's meeting uh, on it, and I share the, uh, Action San Diego and I share the same concerns, which is that the intent of uh, the motion that was passed at the last Built Heritage Committee seemed to indicate to staff to hire an engineer or a consultant or an expert that was able to take an, ex uh, an extended look at uh, the existing building and see truly what could be retained. That, that is my understanding of uh, you know, sit sitting here last time and, and seeing the motion brought forward. Uh, that was the intent or my understanding of the intent of that motion. Now, the Cook Report is an extensive report as to uh, you know, some, of, some of the challenges with the existing building. But to me, it neglects to identify uh, the, the reality of what, what I think to be uh, demolition by neglect or what, what tends towards it. And I was expecting out of the Cook Report some clarity as to which elements, uh, if not most of the building, could be retained. So I, I wonder if staff uh, could comment as to uh, the... Uh, the understanding of the motion that Built Heritage passed, and also uh, if and what did we ask of the, uh, the consultant, in this case Mr. Cook, as per the component of retaining portions of the building. Okay, and I note that our first speaker is um, Chris Vopney from John Cook and Associates. So uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll hold your question. Uh, we'll have our first speaker come up um, and then we'll put that question both uh, to Mr. Vopney and to staff. So is Chris Vopney here? So good morning and welcome. Good morning, so thank you. You have uh, five minutes to speak and then afterwards, uh, as you just heard, there will be questions. Thank you. I'm uh, Chris Bopney from John Cook & Associates, structural engineer in town. Uh, we were retained by the City of Ottawa to provide a review of the existing reports and a visual survey of the property. We reviewed the 2013 geotechnical and building investigation reports, the 2017 uh, geotechnical and building investigation reports, and also the 2017 proposed redevelopment plan and the cultural heritage impact statement provided. Um, as we saw, the building is a two-story masonry and wood-framed structure on concrete foundations. Um, the foundations themselves are formed and poured concrete at the perimeters and block walls at the interiors. Uh, settling of the foundations uh, is apparent by the large cracking that was found. 
And we saw in the northwest corner where a section of the wall was repaired and replaced with a concrete block at about 15 years ago. We see that settlement has continued since then as the concrete block and the interface between the concrete block and the cast-in-place concrete has separated, and we see cracks there. And we also see at the interior block walls, which are both load-bearing and non-load-bearing, that there has been major settlement with large cracking through the joints and the units themselves. We saw past repairs that have been carried out in several campaigns, and all of which have, again, failed, indicating continued settlement. The slab on grade, as we saw in some of the photos, had large cracking, and this is primarily along the perimeter of the wall where settlement would have occurred. In order to retain the building, the majority of the work would be at the foundation level. This is where what we read in the previous geotechnical reports, this is best done by piling. And in order to do this, much of the existing foundation would need to be replaced, or as reinforcing would be a difficult undertaking because of the nature of the original concrete, which would likely be lightly reinforced and unable to receive revised or new load distributions in order to transfer loads to new piling. So this would entail support of the ground floor and all the walls above, and we felt that this would be complicated and difficult and, as a result, expensive because of the tight site and the proximity to the roads and the sidewalks. The exterior masonry of the building appears to be multi-wide composite brick and concrete block. We've noted this, that there are brick headers at every seven courses in the brick, which would act as a tie between the concrete block and the brick. Inherent issues with this type of construction are that the two materials have different properties and result in differential movements from, or differential reactions to movements from any thermal movement. And this often leads to snapping of the brick headers, so we'd have disconnection between the veneer and the backup. This creates a laterally unstable veneer, and this is a particular concern in this building as the loads would be redistributed and there's potential for loading to be, or for the instability to be obvious. So this is something that we would recommend be validated before any temporary support or redistributing of loads is to occur. On the exterior, we also see significant cracking through the joints in the units, and again, as with the interior, we've seen several past repair campaigns, which have again, have reopened up, so all those repaired cracks have again cracked. This is an indication of continued settlement. The wood floor framing is significantly sloped due to this settlement. While the condition of the framing is generally good, we'd expect some environmental damage due to a past flood that happened about two years ago. We feel that the slope is too extensive for liftings, so we would see that shimming or concrete toppings would be a way to level the floors, and this would lead to, or this would require the assessment of the framing and likely reinforcement due to the increased dead loads. And so based on the significant effort to stabilize, we concur with the past reports, including the heritage impact statement that support the demolition. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we'll first ask staff to respond to Councillor Flurry's question about the direction that staff gave John Cook and Associates in its undertaking of the work. The staff report, which is in front of you today, has the full text of the motion that was passed regarding this. So, and the request was for additional review of engineering issues and the possibility of retention of at least portions of the building, and that we were directed to engage a structural engineer with heritage to provide an independent engineering report which speaks to the structure of the existing building. So that was the direction that John Cook and Associates was given, is to undertake a sort of a peer review of earlier work and an independent analysis to determine the extent of the damage in the building. And that is the product that was delivered. 
the, uh, there was nothing specific asking the engineer in the motion, asking the engineer to address the issue of the retention of elements. Uh, Member Smallwood? I have a question that goes to that for the engineer. If, uh, is it for Mr. Vothney? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I guess to the councillor's point, what, what certainly was in my mind when the report, when the previous report came forward was when I looked at some of the issues that were put forward as the rationale for demolition, they were things like the uh, trees taking the moisture out of the soil, the presence of lead of clay and the subsidence which had occurred. And I guess what troubled me uh, was is that the uh, there are trees throughout Sandy Hill. Almost every property has trees on it. And there is lead of clay, from my experience, the properties I have in blocks in either direction have lead of clay. So these uh, particular things are found throughout Sandy Hill and would affect every single property in Sandy Hill. And I noticed in the original report I read, and I see a difference in your report, but in the original Stevenson report on number two on page two under background, it, it identifies the supports as the foundations as being supported by reinforced concrete footings. And I noticed on your um, report, you don't mention that they're reinforced concrete footings. I'm not sure how the Stevenson engineering people determined that, but I did notice it. And the reason that's relevant, I think, is because when there is lead of clay and subsidence, the presence of reinforced footings will often stop that, the, the damage that we see from happening. So if there, is if there are reinforced footings and there are trees and these things that we found throughout Sandy Hill, I guess, and, and I know my experience with the building, the corner of King Edward and Laurier, the Pané House, that building had localized subsidence of about 10 inches. Uh, on this one, there's only about two inches. So I'm wondering what is it that that affects this building, that doesn't affect every other building in Sandy Hill, and that we wouldn't look at every building as being potentially demolished if, it, if somebody didn't maintain the foundation on an ongoing basis. Uh, speaking to the presence of the reinforcing, it's something that it's, it's likely that there is reinforcing there. Um, whether it was, well, it's unlikely that it was designed for any differential movement. That's something that can be uh, accommodated. So in order to retain um, the building, the structure, um, there would be reinforcing or replacement of some of the footings to, to be able to, to, the, the, the new, to the known situation that's occurring there. Um, the settlement has occurred. It's obvious in, in the interior, in the, from the interior, uh, in the basement. We see all the cracking. So while it's something that can be addressed, it would be significant to, to reinforce those footings and foundation walls. Councillor Thurd, do you have any questions uh, and follow up for Mr. Gopney? I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like to follow up with you as to. It's a substantial report. Uh, you know, you're a very professional organization. I want to ensure that that uh, is not put in question here. Um, but I, I don't see in the report any elements. It, obviously, it speaks to cost of the overall upkeep or the over. Uh, you know, if, if measures were going to uh, to be taken. But I, there's not no specific areas. Or maybe I I missed it as to wh which elements could be kept. Uh, as part of retaining. Could you maybe speak to that? Is it something you've considered? Is it something that was out of scope uh, in your review? So when uh, considering this, like if we isolate and consider the structure, which is what we reviewed, um, we feel that most of the structure could be retained with significant intervention at the footings. Um, so we, there would be opportunities to repair um, the masonry and, and, uh, and to re-level the floors uh, using um, a secondary means of, uh, of shimming or, uh, or leveling. Um, and, but in terms of the structure uh, above the foundation level, um, there would be opportunity, though significant, to, to retain structure. And is that referred to in your report? Did I miss? Yes, yes. Okay. Maybe you could, maybe we could take it offline and you could 
share those pages with me because I sure they weren't as clear as what you're describing to me now. Thank okay. you. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Romney, for coming out this morning. Uh, the next speaker on our list is uh, Judah Mulalu. Good morning, and welcome to the subcommittee, and you have five minutes to speak. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, do I have an opportunity to plug in? For, um, Do you have H HDMI? No. Oh. Okay. Um, we seem to have technical issues. Uh, perhaps I'll just. Do you want to speak to mine, Ron? Um, I wanted to do speak more about you know the context and um, sort of where we started and where we are now. And I've got some visuals that um, would have uh, benefited uh, that conversation. Um, Uh, no, I don't have it. I could make a suggestion, which is, uh, as you're sorting out the technical issues, I could call another speaker to sit in that chair, and while the uh, while the other speaker is speaking, if there's a way of resolving the technical issues, uh, oh, then. So why don't I call David Jeans up to this microphone here, and Mr. Mulalu, while Mr. Jeans is speaking, you can work with staff yes, to sort right. out your technical issues. Thank you. So, good morning again, Mr. Jeans. Uh, yes, thank you. I was going to uh, suggest perhaps that uh, Action Sandy Hill should speak first, but I think it may be okay if I just go ahead now. Um, the, uh, you have uh, their report was submitted early this morning, and ours uh, short one was submitted uh, somewhat later, and for that I apologize. Uh, but. Um, Heritage Ottawa still opposes the uh, recommendation to approve demolition of the building uh, for reasons similar to our, our previous presentation to Build Heritage Subcommittee on February 7th. Uh, and uh, we feel that it should still be possible to uh, repair the foundation uh, and retain at least the shell of the existing building for incorporation into, in, into the new design. Uh, we have gone through the Cook Report. We certainly respect the, uh, uh, the, the competence and experience of, of the Cook organization in this report. Uh, and uh, we're, we're more concerned today with the, that report than with the design. We're not commenting on, on uh, this proposed replacement design that's in front of you. Uh, as you have seen, uh, and have heard just now, uh, the retention of the building is structurally feasible uh, at a cost. Uh, we are concerned that uh, the reason that we have got to the present situation was essentially uh, because of a demolition by neglect situation, the, the well-known uh, subsidence problems that have been discussed uh, in some detail already this morning uh, were not properly addressed uh, in dealing with the foundation, uh, but, but merely with temporary repairs to the walls, and that the, uh, the building need not have got to the point uh, that it is right now. But even at the point that it is right now, as you've just heard uh, from the consultant, uh, it, uh, uh, it could be repaired and, and, and stabilized. We've, uh, as part of our review of the report, we've put forward some suggestions. These are obviously not an engineering recommendation, but they're just some bullet points as to, uh, uh, in our experience of, uh, exp uh, of uh, people with considerable expertise within our Heritage Ottawa organization, that there could be a process to uh, repair the foundation, uh, certainly gut the building and not attempt to preserve the interior uh, but to restore the building to a state where it could be uh, incorporated with its exterior features uh, into a new design. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, finally, we do uh, continue to support the historical association with Lester Pearson uh, as outlined by Action Sandy Hill in the previous presentations to you. Uh, he did uh, do his most important work uh, regarding the Suez Crisis, uh, the uh, winning the Nobel and receiving the Nobel Prize, uh, and becoming liberal leader while living in this building. And there are plenty of other designated buildings where the building itself is not the reason or directly associated with the success of the occupant. But in this particular HCD, uh, the uh, association of residences of various prime ministers with the HCD is one of the defining characteristics. Uh, so uh, it, uh, going back to the recommendation, we, we oppose the recommendation for demolition and uh, would prefer to see a design which incorporates uh, at least the shell of the existing building uh, in, in the development of a new chancery. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Jeans? No, I see none. So, uh, Mr. Mulalu, have you sorted out your technical challenges? Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, your five minutes will start now. Press the button. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the uh, committee. I would like to uh, speak to uh, the context with, within which um, our design solution for 231 Coburg Street was formulated and uh, um, just basically look at what's existing and look at the process in terms of our collaboration with um, the city and heritage planning and uh, also you know the consultations that we've had with uh, uh, Action Sandy Hill and uh, 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 Councillor Flores office as well. Um, most of these slides I will just uh, uh, fly through uh, because uh, um, they were essentially covered in uh, Ms. Coote's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, but basically, you know, where we started is essentially here where the property sits very, very tight to the lot and with, with, no, with no opportunity for, for landscaping. And uh, make this move faster. So as you can see, this is uh, beginning here. Um, just really a quick, a quick run through of uh, the existing context, just to show um, the different character types of building styles. This is just immediately to the north. Well, that's a daily avenue, and we've got some quick uh, streetscape um, photos to show just how varied this context is. So as you can see, that's da daily to, to Wilbrod Street on the east side. You can see that uh, the, the different styles, you know, the sizes of the buildings, um, and how they vary. That's our building uh, at 231 Coburg Street. Uh, and now this is the other side. Oh, jeez, what's happening here? 
right? It also very, very, you know, varied. And now this is along World Broad, which is even more pronounced. Uh, the blue arrow is 231 Coburg Street, and you can see from the right all the way to the left, it's just a tapestry of architectural styles and, 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 uh, uh, and building sizes. Um, but that withstanding, okay, this is um, the south side with the, the tall apartment building there, um, which you know really uh, just brings home that point of you know this architectural tapestry uh, in this district. So essentially, you know, to reiterate uh, uh, Ms. Kuth's point, there wasn't really much in terms of, you know, a, a character defining attributes of existing building that could be retained. But still, you know, with that second cornice line that, we, that, that was mentioned and the octagonal window, we tried to integrate as much of what could be, you know, integrated and interpreted in a, in a contemporary, you know, uh, mod, mod, modern style. And also um, the materiality uh, revisions and attention to um, um, uh, the the cultural heritage impact Tumulado. statement feedback. I, I just want to give you, you have about 30 seconds left. Yes, the yeah, well, and, and then we, you know, the responses to the cultural heritage impact statement uh, essentially um, reflected in where we ended up, which was extensively covered in Ms. Uh, Coote's report. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Mulalu? No, I see none, so thank you very much for coming to speak this morning. Thank you. Um, so our final speaker on the list is Francois Brega. Good morning and welcome to the subcommittee. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, committee. I'm Francois Brega. I live in uh, Sandy Hill. You have received uh, earlier today the uh, submission by Action Sandy Hill. I will not repeat what's in it, but I do endorse the views that were expressed there, as well as those of um, David uh, Jeans for uh, Heritage uh, Ottawa. What I would like to do is to raise two contextual matters which I feel are relevant to this uh, application. The first one concerns the, uh, the vexing uh, question of uh, demolition by uh, neglect, a, uh, uh, a development that we certainly uh, oppose. And this is not just a theoretical uh, problem. In uh, Sandy Hill, there is uh, another property at uh, 30 Blackburn Avenue that uh, belongs to a foreign government that has sat empty for close to a year. Recently, the electricity to that property has been cut off. And uh, I'm concerned that uh, any decision that this committee uh, make not send an, uh, an unintended signal to the owner of uh, 30 Blackburn that demolition by neglect is uh, a, uh, a possible way of uh, managing a building in, uh, in San Diego. The um, second contextual matter that I, I want to raise is, is a historical one that Mr. Jeans has already referred uh, to. Uh, ten prime ministers lived in Sandy Hill at different uh, times of uh, their lives. This represents an unequal concentration of uh, leaders in uh, any neighborhood in, um, in uh, Canada. And a walk through Sandy Hills, in, in fact, offers an opportunity for a civics uh, lesson that can't be offered anywhere else in, in the country. So history uh, matters, and uh, for those uh, reasons, uh, I oppose uh, the application.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, any questions for uh, Mr. Brega? I see none. Thank you very much for coming out this morning. Okay, we're going to move now into uh, questions and comments to staff. Um, are there any questions to staff on this item? Um, uh, Member Quinn. Uh, yeah, this comes back to the question of uh, raised this morning about demolition by neglect. And um, I'm just referring here to a conclusion on page 11, the first bullet, which states... Ex excuse, is that sorry, the staff report or the I'm Cook sorry. report? Yeah, sorry, staff report. The staff report. Uh, it's just a quick, a short bullet uh, referencing the engineering reports in general, including um, the John Cook report, uh, concluding that the initial structure damage to the building was a result of unstable soil conditions that caused differential settling and rendered the building unsafe and was not the result of demolition by neglect. And I think it's, this is a concern that's been raised. Uh, Member Smallwood raised it as well. Just the extent to which... Um, unstable soil conditions in Sandy Hill really do affect a huge percentage of the existing buildings in the area. Uh, and it's incumbent again on owners of these properties to uh, maintain their buildings and address these problems on an ongoing basis uh, so that we don't find ourselves using this as a justification in the future for, uh, for demolition. And I also, uh, the, the note again um, that the, the mention of the building being deemed unsafe, which uh, harkens back to um, uh, Member Podolsky's query at, at our last meeting in February about the evidence um, uh, uh, that uh, at addressing the safety of the building. And I certainly didn't see it in the Cook Report or in the uh, previous one, which I neglected to bring with me this morning. So I'm just a couple of questions there, looking for clarity. That's a pretty broad statement and uh, pretty loaded in some respects. So um, some clarity on that. Your questions aren't exactly clear to me, but I will do my best. Um, I the, knew you would. The, uh, certainly um, the, uh, the question of uh, on, uh, not being safe, the, 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 right. the levels of the floors and the cracking were such that the inhabitants and the employees just determined um, that they would no longer work there because it was safe. Uh, again, I th uh, and, and it was unsafe and I think that it is, uh, again, as I said in February, um, you, you don't need an official statement to say that uh, a building is unsafe. If you feel you're not safe in there, there's no obligation to continue to work there. And that was the conclusion that was reached at the time. Um, in terms of, uh, yes, there is, you know, as, as I am often fond of saying, Sandy Hill is a Sandy Hill and buildings <laughs> shift. Um, this building, uh, again, uh, it, 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 it did shift. There were attempts to repair it um, and it continued to shift. Uh, again, uh, uh, the, um, many of the buildings in Sandy Hill that shift and crack are balloon frame buildings. They are rubble foundations. You know, they might be, have a more flexible structure. Every building is different, and we judge every different building at, you know, and, and its engineering challenges on that building, and that's like the, the Cook report um, you know, uh, found that the, and the other reports that th there was differential settlement, you know, whether or not it could be, it could be repaired. Uh, again, there were attempts and they weren't successful. Uh, okay, thank you for that. Um, I just, it is, um, nonetheless, that bullet is, uh, uh, I think can be, I, I'm concerned about how it can be interpreted going forward. And we certainly talked about that in our last item up for uh, discussion here this morning. And, you know, the value of what is in the staff report has significance. And it's one of the reasons we decided that we could accept the motion as written, the recommendation rather, as written, the staff report recommendation as written, and not include any kind of uh, an amendment to that to address the concerns of Action Sandy or not Action Sand, in that case, Rockcliffe Park, and I believe Heritage Ottawa as well, because the, the wording of the staff report has a value. And 
and supports recommendations. The wording is important. And so I am really concerned about the wording of this bullet, that it implies that, in my reading of it, that any building in Sandy Hill that is not repaired, it can be justified based on these conditions. And I think, Mr. Smallwood, you also addressed this to some extent. And I think probably Action Sandy Hill as well. I don't own any property in Sandy Hill, but I certainly know from historical research over time that this is not new condition. So that is my point. Okay, thank you. I guess I have a question to staff that I'll put now. So reading from page 12 of the staff report, under additional changes, staff write, after quoting the motion from February 8th, city staff reviewed the retention or incorporation of a significant portion of the existing building into the new building, as directed in the VHSE motion, but did not encourage the applicant to do so, as the building scored low in the architecture and context categories on the heritage survey form. That sentence caught my attention because whether or not staff believed that the building scored low in the architecture or context categories was not a relevant factor, and it was not relevant in the direction that VHSE gave. The only additional information that this committee asked staff to consider was the additional information in the independent review. And a plain reading of that paragraph suggests that staff had their own opinions, notwithstanding the direction from the committee, that the applicant be encouraged to provide a revised application that retains or incorporates a significant portion of the existing building. So I wonder if staff can explain that sentence. The resolution, again, it was looked into. They did, the applicant did examine the possibility of retention, but this bullet is an or bullet. It is that based on the additional, that the applicant be encouraged to prepare a revised application that retains or incorporates or a new design that better reflects. And so staff took the or and encouraged the applicant to prepare a new design that better reflects the recommendations. The or is very, it was very clear to us, and that was, we did look at retention and, again, what could be retained, bricks or whatever, and then we defaulted, we went to the or because it wasn't and, it was three things. Hire an engineer to look at it, and based on the, and as the result of that, we had two choices, either to encourage the applicant or to retain or to develop a new design. That is why we took the approach that we did, and, again, this paragraph to which you refer on page 12 reflects our thinking on how we reached the either or and fell on, landed on the or a new design. Okay, thank you for that answer. I think what I'll do is I'll provide some wrap-up comments before we go to a vote if there are no more questions to staff. Do you have questions to staff? Do you want to wrap up first before I do? Go ahead. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Vous avez entendu Patrimoine Ottawa et puis, évidemment, Action Côte de Sable qui ont parlé de l'importance de l'ensemble de l'œuvre de Monsieur Pearson, évidemment aussi du propriétaire du bâtiment actuel qui a, année après année, fait de mauvaises réparations ou même allé jusqu'à abandonner le bâtiment. I think a couple of components are also important and weren't presented as clearly today, which is we have an initiative in Sandy Hill, as many of you know, called the Prime Minister's Rule. And the idea is to get out of the Parliament buildings and really walk into communities and see what it means to be a capital city and how prime ministers and elected national leaders lived and would have lived in our community generally. And that 
fits uh, across many of our communities, including Sandy Hill. And um, the significance of that work uh, plays into to this application in, one, in, res in its respect. Obviously, uh, for me, it, it goes beyond that, and it's truly uh, a, um, a demolition, a request to, to demolish because of neglect. And, um, and I do feel that the intent of committee at the last meeting was to find a way to uh, retain portions of the building or, or the building itself. And I don't feel that, that uh, th those efforts uh, were presented to you today. So I would ask uh, on those three fundamentals to uh, overturn the staff position and, uh, and really uh, go get the applicant to go back and, and see what can be done in this property to retain. And, and at the, at the, if they can't retain the full sum of the building, then come back and, and, and present the case for portions uh, to be retained. But uh, for me, uh, demolition would, uh, would be a mistake. Allowing demolition uh, today would, would certainly be a mistake. So I hope that I can uh, count on, on committee support in that regards. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you for those comments, Councilor Fleury. Uh, Vice Chair Podolsky. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just like to say that uh, I'm going to uh, vote against the staff recommendation and uh, the reasons for it are the following. Uh, number one, I appreciated the uh, commissioning of the Cook report uh, to uh, look at the structural condition and to uh, do a peer review on the previous reports. Um, the findings of that report and the earlier structural reports, which I read very diligently, um, do attribute the settlement uh, to a likely cause, which is the dewatering of the uh, Lita clay below the, uh, below the foundations. And as has been made abundantly clear, around uh, this room and in the reports. This is not um, an unusual circumstance. Uh, Lita clay is not an unstable so soil. It can be destabled by dewatering. So I think that it's important to know that this uh, happens periodically. And uh, I think that one of the things that is evident from the uh, the peer review by Cook and Associates is that the building can be stabilized and reused. Uh, I think that what was also evident is that in the earliest report uh, by the uh, geotechnical engineers, uh, Patterson, that one of the things that could contribute to settlement is uh, frost action. And it seems to me without having a special study done of it, by leaving the building vacant for a number of years, unheated, as the Ugandan High Commission did, this allowed frost to get into the building, into the, uh, the footings, and could contribute to the uh, continued settlement of it. So there is human action here that helped to uh, uh, exacerbate the conditions, in my view. And I think that uh, this is important to note that there, in my view, notwithstanding the staff conclusion, there is a contribution of demolition by neglect to the condition of the building, including the mold in it from the, uh, you know, the water leaks that came through the roof. So I don't think that we can accept the staff conclusion that uh, this is not a result of demolition by neglect. There is a significant factor here that we need to uh, identify. The second uh, reason for uh, voting against the staff recommendation is that uh, the argument that because uh, Prime Minister Pearson lived here for such a short time that there's no historic value relating to that, I think that uh, if we look at the, uh, the Norman Bethune house, he only he was born there and he lived there only three years, but that was not a reason why the uh, uh, Historic Monument Board in Canada and Foreign Affairs didn't create a National Historic Site there. It doesn't matter how long you uh, live there. And I think dismissing the Pearson uh, 
error there, I think, is not really credible. And thirdly, the third reason for voting against the staff recommendation is that the proposed new building is unsympathetic to the heritage character of the heritage district. It does not meet the guidelines. There's been a struggle with the architects and the applicant to get them to modify an earlier design, but it really has not resulted in an outcome. And I hope that if the Built Heritage Committee rejection of this application is endorsed by city council, there will be a message to the Ugandan High Commission to really be more cognizant of their role as diplomats to this country and to look at community values and do their best to make a significant contribution, such as some of the other embassies and high commissions have done in the Sandy Hill area and other parts of the city. So, Mr. Chair, having declared that I will vote against the motion, I'm interested in the comments of the other members of the committee. Okay. Any other comments before I provide some wrap-up comments myself? Member Small. Thank you. I share your concerns, and I would oppose it just because I haven't seen anything here that tells me why this particular building should be demolished. All the buildings in Sandy Hill face the same issue, and most owners take the required action. In this case, they abandoned the building and didn't take the required action. So I think if we accept this, we're just encouraging that as being an out for someone who doesn't wish to take care of the property. Okay. I'm going to provide a few comments of my own at this stage. So this is a very difficult issue before us, and the reason it's difficult is that when this came to us in February, we adjudicated the matter on the basis of a substantive referral to staff, which I think in hindsight was flawed in its language, and I take responsibility for that. I think in hindsight we should have drafted a different referral to staff, which made more clear in the letter of the language what was clearly the spirit of this committee, which others have noted. It was very clear from the verbal discussion we had that our preference was to see an opportunity for some retention of this building. And I think I thought that on the basis of that clear verbal intention, that would be how staff would interpret the motion. However, on the strict reading of the motion, there's no question that we put an or in there, and we put an or that wasn't conditioned. If I could go back in time, I would have said, or if deemed structurally infeasible, a new design. But we didn't do that, and I'm now in an awkward situation of having to go back to the initial referral, and strictly on the letter of the law, staff have come back to us. We have a conclusion from the independent study that we requested, which says, based on this and the significant effort to undertake stabilization, we support recommendations for demolition. So what happened? We gave this back to staff. We said we need an independent review. On that basis, either retain a portion or come back with a new design that better reflects the recommendations. The independent report said we support demolition. There were some admittedly modest changes to the new design, but modest changes that did better reflect the recommendations. So on the strict reading of the motion, I think what's before us now has satisfied what our initial referral was. That said, I'm not happy with the state of affairs we're in for two reasons. One of them is I think, although it perhaps was the right conclusion, I think it was made on the wrong basis. I think that sentence that I read out earlier, city staff reviewed the retention or incorporation of a significant portion of the existing building into the new building as directed in the BHAC motion, but did not encourage the applicant to do so. I really don't understand on what basis staff felt that it was within their purview to not encourage the applicant to do so, having heard the discussion at BHAC and having read a referral motion that said that the applicant should be encouraged to 
prepare a revised application that retains or incorporates a significant portion of the existing building. Um, you know, and that gets at some uh, fundamental principles of uh, our democratic system, which is the public service provides courageous advice. Uh, we listen to that courageous advice. Uh, we then make the decision as elected and appointed members, uh, and we provide guidance. And then what's due is what's called loyal implementation. And in this case, uh, I think you can ask yourselves whether or not uh, the implementation uh, was strictly speaking following what was clearly uh, the intention of this committee for a preference for uh, a result or a consequence that saw uh, a portion of this building being being in incorporated. That being said, uh, there's no question that when we first saw this in February, we recognized that this was demolition by a neglect. And on that one, I think as a city, we too need to take responsibility for the fact that this building sat vacant for 19 years, and during no period in that were there any uh, city uh, for two the years. Building's been and uh, for uh, during that period, there was no property inspection. There were no violations I I issued. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm happy that the mayor has uh, struck a task force, which has as one of its objectives making sure that demolition by neglect does not occur in vacant buildings. And I think the good news is uh, we shouldn't be seeing this anymore, but I acknowledge in this case, and this is why I think we struggled in, in February, um, you know, this is possibly very much a case of demolition by a neglect, but for which uh, the city has some responsibility uh, for failing to act on that uh, during the time that this building uh, was degrading. So uh, I provide that context to say that uh, I feel compelled on the basis of uh, perhaps in hindsight uh, a flawed motion um, to support the staff recommendation only because strictly speaking uh, they followed the instruction uh, but I'm discouraged uh, by the fact that uh, there was not more effort made both by city staff and the applicant uh, to follow what was very clearly uh, the spirit and the hope of this committee to have an outcome where a portion uh, of the existing building was retained. So I think we'll do yeas and nays. We have a technical motion from Vice Chair Podolsky. There's a technical motion which has to do with the updating of the cultural heritage impact statement. And it's this, that whereas the cultural heritage impact statement referenced in the report as document 15, which was distributed with the agenda for the Belt Heritage Subcommittee meeting of April 12th, was not the most current version of the CHIS, be resolved that the CHIS be replaced with the most current version dated November 22nd, 2017, prepared by Robertson Martin Architects. Is that correct? So the amendment is carried, and now yeas, yeas and nays on the overall. Councillor Wilkinson? Yes. Uh, Member Quinn? No. Member Smallwood? No. Councillor McKenney? No. Councillor Moffat? No. Vice Chair Podolsky? No. Chair Newsbell? Yes. Two yeas, five nays. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so that uh, concludes that item. No. Nope. We need a refusal motion, yes, we do. which the vice chair is going to introduce. Do I need uh, guidance on the wording? There'll be no 
four is in the motion. That's why I gave you the motion in advance. I need to change it so that the refusal goes up in the plan. Okay. Ready with the refusal motion. Where is report ACS 2018 PIE RHU-009 recommends approval of the application, and whereas the Built Heritage Subcommittee wished to recommend refusal of the application for demolition, therefore be it resolved that recommendations one and two of the staff report be amended as follows. One, delete the word approve and replace it with refuse, and that recommendations three and four be deleted. Okay. So we're going to, I'm going to assume that's carried with this, with the inverse vote, five to two. And do we need to do anything else? That's carried with, do we need the amendment? So the amendment bringing the new CHIS into the report, does that need to be reintroduced, the technical motion, because that, the overall first motion failed? So there was a technical motion to introduce the revised CHIS into the report. So I guess we'll reintroduce it. The technical motion amended which recommendation, Chair, because the refusal motion is very narrow and does not change the substance of the reports, but to amend and delete, unless it is in recommendation three or four. No, it wasn't. So we're good. So you are fine. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. Okay. So let's, let's move on then to other business. And I know Member Quinn had an item to raise. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is just a small item I brought to your attention this morning. I received an email last night with some photographs. This is pertaining to the Duncannon apartment buildings on Metcalf Street at the corner of Cooper. It was brought to my attention that windows, the leaded windows, which are an important character defining feature of this designated building, designated, I should add, under both part four and five of the Ontario Heritage Act, were being replaced. And I actually drove by the building on my way in here this morning just to make sure what side of the building, and it's on the south side, not the corner, which is Cooper. And, but nonetheless, very visible as one is driving north on Metcalf Street, but overlooking a parking lot. And I understand from, from staff that this has been negotiated over a number of years with the owner of the building. So if you could just perhaps let us know what the status is. And I think also there was a question earlier from one of my colleagues on the committee about whether the windows that have been removed from the building are being retained. A heritage permit was issued for the windows at the Duncannon apartment in December 2017. As a result of the ongoing communications and discussion between the city and the owner of the building and his heritage consultant, who is Robert Martin, who is here today, who I asked to stay on in case there were further technical questions. But I can tell you that the, in the end, the permit was issued for the, to restore the windows on the Cooper and Metcalf facades and to replace the windows on the other two facades with, with the units that you see here. So that was what was agreed to, is that the public facades with the feature windows and that were, that were on, face the main streets would be restored and the rest would be replaced. As is the case with all heritage applications, this was sent to Councillor McKinney, the ward councillor, for, for comment. And she, she is also aware and, and agreed with the, with the intervention, had no objection to the intervention. And because it is, because windows are done through delegated authority that, that was approved in house and there are also no building permits required for window replacement. So the, the way we keep track of these is through the delegated authority process. Thank you. Just a little follow-up question. 
Is the reason that permission was given to change the windows up on the south-facing elevation because of the potential of a building going up on the parking lot in the future? Certainly that was part of the approach to that, is that that vacant lot is not going to be vacant forever, so therefore the south facade will be a lot less visible in the future. And again, this is the back of the building, so this facade was also agreed. We also agreed that the newer units could be placed there. And in terms of the question of retention, if any of the windows that are being removed from these units can be used to replace ones that have weathered poorly on the facades where they're being retained, they will be substituted in. Other than that, it's the individual property owner will determine what to do with the others. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. If no other business, we can adjourn. But just a quick note in terms of our next meeting, that it's taking place on the 10th of May, 2018. And just also to give members a heads up that we've scheduled a joint BHSC and planning committee meeting on June 26th to consider the recommendation for the next phase of the Heritage Inventory Project, which includes undesignated properties throughout the city, mostly within the Green Belt, a whole series of neighborhoods, and to make sure that residents had an opportunity to appear and we didn't force them to come twice. We're holding a joint meeting on that item at the end of June, just to give you a heads up for your calendars, June 26th. But we'll see you on the 10th of May before then. So are we adjourned? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.